Thank you so much. It's my, really my pleasure to talk to you um, about a consortium that I direct called the Autism Biomarkers Consortium for Clinical Trials and really the, the work that we've undertaken to try to uh, advance the goal of biomarker qualification with the FDA. Uh, I think that in, in terms of background, I'll go through some of this quickly because I think it's well understood by many of you. Um, we know that autism is a uh, is a behaviorally defined condition. We know that it's based in our genes, it's based in our brain, it's probably based in lots of aspects of biology, but at present we're really limited in our description of it diagnostically and, and really in terms of the most clinical decision making uh, to behavior. We know that it's related to social communication and repetitive and restricted behaviors and sensory behavior. Really, the when we think about unifying features of autism, from my perspective, uh, what we've got is the social communication. That's really the only thing that we can be sure of is true in, in any one person with autism. We know that not just in that in regard to diagnostic features, but other features, it's an extremely heterogeneous phenotype, um, of course, with the core social feature, but then many other things that are likely to impact biomarker evaluation. For example, wide variation cognitive ability in autism makes it a complicated disorder to try to understand biological markers. The, the gold standard presently for quantifying, quantifying symptoms, both in, in clinical work uh, and, and in clinical research, is um, clinician rated uh, behavioral assessments, parent interviews, and parent or uh, self-report questionnaires, which um, which had significant limitations in that they're inherently subjective to a degree, even when standardized, and they also are measuring things that are, are distal to biology. There are, as, as Pramila said, there are no established functional biomarkers for any context of use presently in autism. So we're, uh, we're starting from scratch, so to speak. So what do we have working for us in, in this domain? Well, one, we have technologies where we can either measure the central nervous system well, or we can measure its really proximal outputs that are viable in this population. And that's not a small task. We're talking about children, many of whom have intellectual disabilities or who have significant sensory uh, you know, sensitivities that interfere with their ability to tolerate certain procedures. So when we think about things like EEG, electroencephalogram, and eye tracking, the fact that they can be collected effectively in this group of people is, uh, is, is important. What's also important is that these are, are, are both relatively economical and accessible technologies so that should biomarkers be discovered that have utility in large-scale clinical research or in clinical practice that could be deployed in a reasonable way. The, um, there are, are many, many, I'm going to talk about a few today, but there are many candidate markers in autism. For me, it, it's useful to think about the, what they measure. You know, I think we'll hear a lot today about markers that are associated with specific mechanisms. Um, there are, are many fewer, I, from my perspective, kind of functional marker, functional biomarkers related to mechanism in autism. And part of that is because we know so little about the mechanism in autism, certainly when we think about neural function. Neur neural function. Another way that we can think about markers is as, as biological indices, but related to symptom domains. So by, an example might be a marker that tells us something, you know, direct output, uh, you know, a direct recording of brain activity, but we're thinking that it's an index of, um, you know, of social function, but potentially with greater sensitivity than um, my rating as a clinician or greater than a parent rating. And, and today, really, I'll be talking more about markers that are in this second category. Markers that don't necessarily tell us about a specific mechanism. In fact, for some of them, the mechanism that generates the biomarkers is still not entirely clear. However, but that are taking us closer towards biology relative to the current clinical behavioral standards that we're stuck with. The kinds of things for most of these kinds of biomarkers that we that we understand in suggest, suggestive ways, and, and, and I'll tell you why I say suggestive in a moment, really that, that we see differences in people with autism from people who don't have autism, and we see that they associate with symptomatology. And the reason I call that suggestive, um, because there are many, many studies for many of the biomarkers that, that, we, that we focus on the Autism Biomarkers Consortium. However, there's inconsistent reproducibility, and we don't know exactly why. Uh, 
And so um, we're not sure whether these are telling us something that's true about subgroups of people with autism or their or very variation from study to study methodology could impact it. But the bottom line is there are there's strong evidence in, in many individual studies, but when we look at the overall literature, it's hard to say that it's solid evidence in that there's so much variability. There's also places where I wouldn't even say it's suggestive evidence, where we really don't understand much at all. Um, in terms of many of these biomarkers, functional biomarkers, what their stability is over time, um, you know, in, in the very short term, if we took repeated measurements when we don't expect the person to have changed much, would they be stable? But then also these are children whose brains are developing actively, um, who's, who are being intervened with in, the, in, in school and in therapies, and we don't know conversely how stable some of these markers are as children develop, but then also how sensitive they are if clinical status changes. And then lastly, we really don't understand for most of these markers what the influence of methodological variation is. You know, uh, in, this, in this picture here, you see the EEG net that we use. Does it matter if a different EEG net is used? Does it matter if I show different kinds of visual stimuli even within the same category to a child? These are things that are unknown. And these kinds of gaps and understanding in the context of a, you know, a promising knowledge base is the reason for the ABCCT study. So the idea of the ABCCT is, is to do a large-scale study. It's multi-site based here at Yale and across five other sites. It's a naturalistic study. We observe children passively over six months. We do not uh, administer an intervention. It's a study in a large sample, 280 children with autism and 119 with typical development ranging in age from 6 to 11, and in, in a wide IQ range from the intellectually disabled range to the well above average range. The, the biomarkers selected for evaluation were really the ones that were showing the strongest evidence in published literature. So a set of four EEG markers and five eye tracking markers that have a number of studies supporting them, but could benefit from a large scale, more rigorous study to address some of the weaknesses in the literature that I mentioned in the last slide. We also, for the reasons that I mentioned, focused on bar markers of social communication. Um, the idea that there's many, many things that are relevant to study in autism, but given the focus in many, of many interventions on social communication and the centrality of, of social difficulties to the condition, the, that was what we thought was perhaps the best bang for the buck in terms of a content area. We also administered a very extensive clinical battery, really the, the status quo, if you will, of things that are used in clinical trials and and in diagnostic practice. Our longitudinal design in, involved three visits, a baseline visit, a six-week visit, which gives us a sense of short-term stability when we wouldn't expect that much change in response to intervention or, um, or minimal human development, if you will. And then a 24-week visit when we would have more time to see if children had gotten better in the course of intervention Certainly children have gotten six months older and let us look at stability over the longer term. We drew blood, um, which is now being genotyped. Uh, un unusual things about the ABCCT are one, a, a really, I don't, I don't use the word unprecedented lightly and I, and I don't use it to be provocative. It is true. We, um, we administered our study as if it were a clinical trial. So uh, we administered our study towards good according to the standards of good clinical practice, GCP. So the regulatory standards were extremely high. Uh, methodologically, we had a, a, an extremely stringent training program. All of the hardware across the consortium was ensured to be identical. All training was done centrally, literally flying a person to these five sites. Obviously, it was a, it was a different time back then, uh, flying a person to all these sites to make sure that everything was doing, being done exactly the same. And then also statistically. So, you know, in, using biomarker modalities that produce very, very rich data sets, very supportive of, of exploratory and analytic approaches, we really um, did an incredible amount of data reducing, really to make sure that we had declared primary biomarkers, primary derived variables, and really to make specific directional hypotheses because of our goal to bring this to the FDA. And so we, we wanted to be clear that this wasn't the hypothesis establishing study, this is a hypothesis confirming study. Another unique thing is a collaborative governance that involves scientists in academia as well as scientists uh, at four different 
different institutes at NIH, scientists in industry and scientists at the FDA as well, and a strong emphasis on open data with all of our, our data that we collected being shared in real time. The, the biomarker battery that, that we used, um, these some of these, I'm happy to share my slides and I put some of this there for archiving. I'm, I'm not gonna read through all of these things. What I wanna highlight is of the four EEG markers and of the five eye tracking markers, there were two that we declared as primary. One was uh, an event-related potential called the N170, and I'll, and I'll tell you more about it and how it's derived. That was our primary EEG marker. And our primary eye tracking marker was actually a composite across three different experiments, uh, all conceptually, uh, you know, conceptually similar in that they were evaluating the amount of time and attention that children with autism pay to human beings in scenes. This is the, uh, and I certainly won't enumerate all of these, but this is the long list of clinical measures that we used in the study. Um, our data collection concluded in May 2019. As you can see, um, groups were similar in age and sex composition, um, about nine years old on average, a, a, a pretty diverse sample um, in terms of ethnicity, um, especially in the autism group. Uh, the other thing to highlight here is that in terms of the, the cognitive level of the group of children with autism, this is a a, a pretty cognitively able group, with a, you know, although some of them had IQs that were pretty low, on average, they were in the average range. The ERP biomarker, the, or EEG, ERP for those who aren't experienced in the field is just a way of processing the EEG to get a signal that tells you about a specific cognitive process. It's called the N170. This is a, a neural index of the, the very earliest stages of face processing. It's telling us about activity that is in regions that are germane to autism, like the superior temporal sulcus and the fusiform gyrus. And what a, a, a long series of studies dating back to 2004, or now probably 40 studies, has indicated is that this N170 response is slower in children children through adults with autism. The way we quantify this biomarker is really by having a child wear an EEG net and flashing pictures of faces, upside down faces and houses at them and, and recording their brain responses. This is uh, one of the things that we planned in the ABCCT was to harmonize some of our assays with a European consortium called EU, EU AIMS that Chris Chapman will hear about today, hear from today is involved with. And this is a, a, an example of one of the biomarkers that we did in both studies. So we have confirmatory samples uh, intercontinentally. And what we predict in this experiment is that we would see, as, as we've seen before, that the N170 is slower in people with autism. And that we did see that. Um, we see that people with autism are, um, are slower, 210 milliseconds approximately on average relative to 196 in typically developing children, things that that you know confirmed the hypothesis. There are also things that we've learned from this data set. One is that we are um, pretty successful at collecting this kind of information in a group of children with autism. We we got valid data on 76% of the children. We got it from 97% of the typically developing children. We see that in both groups, it's a, a level of stability over the course of six weeks based on an intraclass correlation coefficient that we describe as adequate. And we see that. Um, that there are relationships to the phenotype that are that are sign statistically significant but not strong. So we see that people who have these these slower N170 latencies actually show more impairment in face recognition. They show more impairments in relative um, in different social skills. The the other marker that we declared as primary was an eye tracking marker. This is called the ocular motor index of gaze to human faces. Um, this is, you know, as I said, across three experiments, the amount of time that children spend fixating on on-screen faces and heads. Again, you know, this is not a measure of brain activity, but we know that it's dependent upon regions relevant to autism, like the amygdala and the STS. And again, a long, a long series of studies, uh, this dating back even further to, to 2002, indicates that people with autism uh, show less attention to faces and abnormal, pa abnormal patterns of attention to faces. The, the three experiments we used, two were videos. Uh, one is, it's called activity monitoring. It's two adults in a very, very structured way engaging in a shared activity. 
We had a second video called Social Interactive, and this um, is less structured, and it's two children playing. Um, this one ha does not have audio, activity monitoring does. And then lastly, static scenes. We're just um, interesting, busy scenes with people in them, but also lots of other things happening. And our, our hypothesis here, again, is that children with autism would look less to faces. And um, consistent, you know, confirming our hypothesis, that is what we saw. We see that eye tracking is a, is a really great, uh, in terms of data quality, biomarker to collect in autism. Uh, we really get valid data from almost everyone that we can get to sit in a chair. We see that it's pretty stable. 0.83 in both groups over six weeks. And again, we see relationships as in uh, the N170 that are associated with the phenotype, but are not um, but are not extremely strong. And the same pattern of results, that people who look less at faces tend to show more impairment in face recognition and these social measures. So with this information, we, um, we engaged with the FDA to, uh, to, to try to proceed with the biomarker qualification process. Uh, this is a relatively new uh, function of the FDA. It's part of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. They have in the, in the past few years established a biomarker qualification program. And it's a, it's a three-stage process. The first stage is a, is a letter of intent where you um, submit some preliminary data, um, declare really what you would see as the context of use for this biomarker. The second stage is to put together a biomarker qualification plan of the data that would need to be collected to provide sufficient evidence to support qualification of the biomarker. And then the last stage is biomarker qualification package. And that really is the, the body of evidence that you collect in support of the biomarker. What, what, what we have done is for these two biomarkers that, that I've described, we have sent in letters of intent. Both were accepted, uh, one in May of 2019, one in March of 2020. This is, um, you know, as is evident from the way I described the process, this is a very, very first step. There's very far to go, but this is also a significant milestone in that these are the first two markers accepted into this program for autism or, or for any neurodevelopmental condition or psychiatric condition. So this is a, a major step forward for our field. The context of use that we described is as a diagnostic biomarker. And I wanna really emphasize not diagnostic in the colloquial sense. One of the, you know, without getting into the arcane details, the FDA offers you in their, their glossary uh, only a, a, a handful of biomarker types that can be submitted. And there isn't, for example, a, a category of stratification biomarker, but that's really what we're talking about. When we say diagnostic, we don't mean diagnostic of the DSM-5 category of autism. We mean diagnostic of a subgroup. And the basic idea is that with um, that, that when we look, this, this is the distribution of the ocular motor index. You can see a, a histogram here stacked, the people with autism on the left in green, the typically developing uh, on the right in blue. And you can see that there is this portion of people with autism autism who, who really don't overlap with the distribution of typically developing. And what we're saying here is that this group of people and this, you know, I mean, this is a very simplistic way to define a threshold for a stratum. Um, so I'll talk more about that in a moment. But the idea is that people who are in this tail uh, may be more biologically homogenous, maybe more phenotypically homogenous, um, but they certainly are more different from typically developing people than most of the other people with autism that we evaluated. And therefore, in selectively analyzing their data or selectively admitting them to, to clinical trials might permit stronger inference in smaller samples. So really for clinical trial enrichment. I'll also make the point, you know, I emphasized a moment ago that I'm not talking about a, a colloquial diagnostic biomarker and you can see why, right? Because most of the distribution is overlapping. And so what we, this would not be a good biomarker to tell us who has autism and who doesn't, but it may be a good biomarker to tell us that this group of people with autism are different from, from these people with autism in meaningful ways. Um, 
since submitting these letters of intent, we've we've had two uh, grants called Cooperative Agreements, UO1s funded, really to support our engagement and our dialogue with the FDA. And there are many, many difficult questions to answer. And this is, is truly uncharted territory uh, for us and for many of the people at the FDA in terms of trying to, to determine how to evaluate psychiatric biomarkers. And the kinds of things that we're struggling with are, are really how to best to articulate the context of use, given the issues I mentioned a moment ago. How do we determine a cut point um, in the autism distribution? And then if once we do determine a cut point, how do we externally validate that subgroup, given that the, the measures that we typically rely on for, for validation are these clinical measures that we think are subjective, that we think are questionably reliable. And so it, it really is, 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 a, is, is a challenging task to figure out a way to, to, to prove with confidence that this group is different in some way beyond just the biomarker values. And then also some kind of technical issues we're working on them with too, in terms of establishing that the, th these results are, could be expected with other equipment, with other experiments, and that really the, the, the biomarker isn't an artifact of any of the specific approaches we use in the study, which we don't have any believe any reason to, to believe that it would be. We also, um, at, this work is ongoing. The, we also, in, in July, were very, very excited to, to receive the opportunity to continue the study with a renewal. Uh, the renewal will last five years and it will entail three separate studies. One is a, a confirmation study, which will essentially be the, the same study in a new sample of children with a, a, a proportion of autism and TD subjects that's more balanced, 200 of each, and that will eliminate one of the assays that we use that I didn't really talk about, but there's a particular assay looking at preference for biological emotion or neurological response to, to biological emotion that wasn't effective. The second study will be a follow-up study where we will bring back the cohort from the, the, the first ABCCT study, um, seeing them between two to five years after we originally saw them to look at long-term stability, to, to have another opportunity to look at sensitivity to change in case children make more progress over this longer period of time. And then also to understand whether biomarker values, you know, five years prior are predictive of functioning uh, in this, in this follow-up study. And then the third study, is a feasibility study to see whether we can collect and whether we can uh, get, get useful information in a much younger cohort of children, three to five year old children. So um, I, I do, I'm, I, it's nice that John started early because I went over by a minute or two, but I think we still have some, some time for questions. And I, um, I do want to thank, this is a, it's a large group. It's a, a wonderful group to work with. Um, and, and there are a lot of people who have made very, very significant contributions seen here in our um, in our organizational chart and in the smiling photograph from a, taken at a time when people could physically be co-located. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you much, so much, Dr. McPartland. Um, I've been a big fan of your work for a long time. So, so we do have uh, a few questions uh, from the audience. So uh, one gets into, um, do you have any descriptive data on the percent of participants in the, 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 the ABCCT trial that were nonverbal? Uh, and if so, um, did you evaluate their IQ and how was it evaluated? There were no participants that were nonverbal in the study. The, the, we, the IQ measure that we used was the differential ability scales. And you know the, the cutoff for this particular study was a cutoff of 60 for whom very few people, I think that you would put into the category of nonverbal. There's an, a separate study that is not part of the ABCCT that, we are, that we're conducting in my lab. It's not part of the broader network. network. And really what, what the point of this study is basically to, to create a setup that is designed to be um, much less reliant upon verbal instructions and examiner directions, a, a more self-directed kind of a behaviorally ergonomic setup, if you will. And we're administering these biomarkers to children in the same age range, but exclusively to children whose IQs are below 60. So in this study, which is, is technically in progress, but is, um, you know, has been very, very hard to get running due to COVID, um, 
we will be seeing hopefully many children with uh, who, who are nonverbal. But at present, that's not something that is very well understood at all for the ERP biomarkers. Uh, it, there have been more children in other studies, not in the ABCT, who are nonverbal effect using the eye tracking biomarkers, and the pattern of results uh, tends to be similar. We don't, in general, see effects of IQ or verbal ability on these biomarkers. Of course, that's not the same thing as studying it in people who are, are nonverbal, but uh, there's not a strong reason to believe that the, the pattern of results we see and the relevance would be any different in people who are nonverbal. Great, thank you. Um, so it looks like you guys have quite the, um, uh, the number of participants that are either falling into the, the autism or the typically developing group. Are, are there thoughts of having uh, a non-ASD developmental delay cohort as, as, a, as a, another uh, control or is that not, not in the works at present? That's again, that's part of the other study that I described, it's in my lab, but it's not a part of the ABCCT. Okay, uh, another question. Um, do you think wearable EEGs uh, could pick up uh, your marker or is this something that could only be uh, detected in a, in a clinical setting? No, I think, well, I think I would love to be able to ask a person who asked the question what they mean by wearable EEGs. Um, there are many, many ways to collect EEG. I mean, a, 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 a very desirable goal, I'll stop short of saying holy grail, but a desirable goal for our field is to have cheap, you know, EEGs that you could wear at home that don't require an experienced person to set up. Um, there are a number of complications with these EEGs. Um, they don't deliver the same quality of data that the the ones that we have in our labs do. Um, there's no reason. There, there is at least one study that indicates that you could get the signal that we're looking at for um, from one of these kinds of like you know commercially available EEG system, which is I'm presuming what they mean by wearable. Um, so I, I, again, I think that it's it's obviously. Deploying this would be, um, you know, is a diff different set of technical problems that we're not, we're, we're not at that stage yet, right? Before I would worry about how we would get these markers into people's homes. I mean, our first step really is to, to, to is to confirm that they are, are worth getting into the home and then worry about it. I will say when we think about EEG, um, I, I think that's the most promising technology for having straightforward, um, you know, really accessible delivery, maybe not at home, but when we think about the way we use EEG presently to screen for hearing loss in newborns using auditory brainstem responses, when we think about um, using EEGs for seizure detection, this, this is a technology that is in almost every hospital and uh, is already used at the population level for screening. And so I think it's one that could be really useful. I think the path that I would see is taking these really um, intense, um, high density by high density, I mean, having 128 electrodes on a person's head and figuring out ways you could distill that. I mean, in principle, you might be able to get the relevant information with one electrode stuck to the, you know, behind a person's ear, but we're not there yet. So um, it's a great question, um, but just to, the, the, you know, the other groups are working on that. I think we're really still focused on shoring up the understanding of the biomarkers under optimal conditions before we're certain it's worth figuring out how to collect them under, you know, in the field collision conditions. Great, thank you. Um, I know this is not a part of, of your talk in the ABCCT, uh, but in your other study, uh, it has uh, been asked um, is there plans uh, in the, the nonverbal group? Are you guys collecting any information on uh, regressions? And is there any plans on looking to see if that's a particular subgroup that, that, that may be of interest? Is that, is that on the radar? Sure. I mean, we'll look at everything. We do collect information. We collect a thorough, you know, kind of medical history and a thorough intervention history. And so we will. Obviously, the, you know, if we're seeing kids 6 to 11, for, I mean, for, I would presume for just about everybody, the regression would be a historical event. And we'll look, we're not recruiting people who have a history of regression, but should they be there, that is something that we'll be able to look at. 